The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Sanctions, name-calling, Canadians tried in closed courts. Tonight, as Canada's relationship with China seems headed in all the wrong directions, we've got a feature interview with China's ambassador to Canada. Then we'll get the view from Canadian China experts on where things go next. It's Tuesday, March 30th, and that's ahead on The Agenda. If there has been a more rocky point in Canada's diplomatic relations with China, it's hard to recall it. What began as a spat over the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou has since spiraled with the apparent retaliatory arrests and trials in China of Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. Song Pei Wu is China's ambassador to Canada, and he joins us now from our nation's capital to discuss these issues and more. Mr. Ambassador, it's a pleasure to have you on our program. How are you today? I'm fine, thanks. And how are you? Very good. Uh, all the better for having you on our program, because I think this is a uh, long overdue conversation about the uh, state of relations between Canada and China. I wonder if I could start by asking you, why do you think the relationship between our two countries is so bad right now? I think it's very clear that from the very beginning, we believe that the incident of Madame Meng it's a main obstacle between the, our two countries, the most difficult issue. And because the United States instigated this political incident and the purpose was try to bring down Huawei. And unfortunately, the Canadian side was involved in that. It took actions to detain Madame Meng while she broke no Canadian laws at all. And I would like to tell you that for all those countries, which have signed the uh, treaties of extradition with the United States, many of them, but only Canadian side took the action. So that's why we urge the Canadian side to take uh, resolute measures to release Madame Meng as soon as possible. And so do I hear you saying, do I, to China. do I hear you saying that if, if Canada somehow arranged to have Madame Meng released from her home arrest, that relations between our two countries would immediately improve? As we have been suggesting, you know, that the release of Madame Meng and her safe return to China will certainly create favorable conditions for our bilateral relationship to be back on track. I want to just read you some numbers from 15 years ago. Uh, there's a polling company called Angus Reid who asked Canadians, do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of China? And 15 years ago, 60% of Canadians said, we have a favorable view, which is pretty good. Today, that number is 14%. 60 back then, 14 today. Do you think that China bears any responsibility for the drop in those numbers? I think when it comes to the bilateral relationship, there are three points we have to bear in mind. First, the principle of mutual respect. And that's very important. And we follow that all the time. But as I mentioned before, the Madame Meng's incident, the Canadian side had not followed that principle. And secondly, is to deepen the mutual understanding. And here, because of the general public, they had been misled by those anti-China forces, and especially those media and the politicians. So for example, when it comes to the Xinjiang issue, it's been very clear that in Xinjiang, there's no genocide at all or any other human rights abuses. Because for Xinjiang, the bigger population more than doubled in the past four decades. And it uh, gained increase by 2.55 million in eight years alone between 2010 and 2018. The increase rate is 25%, far higher than the Han population in the Xinjiang region. And uh, there are more than 24,000 mosques in Xinjiang. And that means one mosque for 530 Muslims on average. So how can anyone call it genocide. But because some certain people here, they would like to uh, politicize the issue. And I want to share with you that for the United States, 
it's ob very obvious that they would like to use the issue to contain China's development because according to a former chief of staff to the U.S. Secretary General, uh, U.S. Secretary of State, Colin Powell, he argued in 2018 that one of the purposes for the U.S. presence in Afghanistan was to make sure that they will create instability in Xinjiang because there are so many bigger population in Xinjiang. So that's good for the United States to foment some unrest together with these bigger people from within rather than from the outside. Okay, so that's Mr. Ambassador, we, we will, yeah, forgive the interruption, we will come back and talk about the Uyghurs more, but I really am interested in why, in why China's reputation around the world seems to have taken such a hit. It's not just with Canada. If you look at polling in other countries as well, China is seen unfavorably by three quarters of British people, seven out of 10 Germans, seven out of 10 French people, 80% of Australians, 86% of Japanese, three quarters of South Koreans. Does it make Xi Jinping concerned that not just Canadians, not just Americans, but so much of the world has an unfavorable view of your country right now? We are not concerned at all because first, when it comes to the uh, situation in China, the Chinese people are in the best position to judge the situation, whether it's human rights or other uh, subjects. So for the ruling party, the Communist Party of China, our mission and aspiration is to seek better lives for the Chinese people and the rejuvenation for the country. And we have been doing so since the very early foundation of the party. That was about 100 years ago. We celebrate the centenary this year. And for the people, they support the government, the ruling party. And according to the international bodies, more than 90% of Chinese, they are in favor of the Communist Party of China and the government. And also around the globe, I think you just mentioned a very small number of Western countries. But the truth is that the vast majority of the countries, they are in support of China's foreign policies, a foreign policy of independence and peace. So that's why during the Human Rights Council in Geneva, just concluded recently, more than 80 countries, they spoke in favor of China's policies in Xinjiang. And also, I think, in the world, more than 170 countries and international organizations, they signed cooperation documents in the area of Belt and the Road. And that's, I think, this uh, international community, what their just voices are. All right, but uh, again, we're, we're talking mostly here about why Canada's and China's relationships are so bad right now. And I note that very recently, one of your colleagues, the Chinese Consul General to Rio de Janeiro, called Prime Minister Trudeau, boy, and said that Mr. Trudeau had ruined relations between China and Canada. I wonder how it is helpful to improving the relationship between our two countries when a consular official of China insults the Canadian prime minister like this. How does that help? That's his personal tweet account. And for us, our policy towards Canada is clear and consistent. We attach importance to this relationship, not as someone suggested that we overlook Canada, no. We value your role in international arena like the United Nations and the G20. And that's also my third point. That is, you know, I just mentioned two points. My third point is that we have the cooperation of mutual benefit, not only in trade and the economic cooperation, people to people exchange, but also on those important issues like coping with climate change, uh, attaining sustainable development, and the fighting pandemic. So there's a lot of things we can do together. But surely, I think it also needs a favorable atmosphere and also the mutual respect is to be there. So that's why we call the Canadian side to reflect on that and to take actions to correct mistakes. And also, a number of Canadian people, they have seen through the nature of Madame Meng's incident. And that's for sure. Well, again, if you're talking about mutual respect, I'm not sure how it helps improve the relationship. And I'm sorry to disagree with you, but I think he did do it, the Consul General. I think he did do it on his official account, not his personal account. I'm not sure how calling the Canadian Prime Minister boy or a running dog, which is an expression that goes back to uh, 
you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago. I'm not sure how that helps. Again, I would like to suggest that his personal Twitter account and our policy is clear. And I think that for us, we would like to develop this relationship on the basis of mutual respect and uh, equality. And also, I think for the Kenyan side, it has the tradition of being independent when it comes to the issues like Cuba, like the Iraq war. I think you demonstrate that fine tradition. So it is hoped that when it comes to the Hmong's incident, that the Kenyan side will also display the wisdom and to judge the issue on the merit of its own and to take decisions on its own to remove those third-party interferences. Okay, Mr. Ambassador, let me try this. Uh, I, I appreciate that China is looking to Canada for a sign of mutual respect, and you would find favor in that. I wonder if the other side of the coin is also fair to point out. For example, if the Chinese could find it in their hearts to release the two Michaels as a gesture of friendship, um, and that would help with mutual respect and getting the relationship back on track. Is that something that China would consider doing? First, I would like to point out that some people here, they also want to link the cases of Madame Meng and those two Canadian citizens. But in fact, they have no connection at all. For those cases involving the two Canadian citizens, they are prosecuted because the suspected crimes of undermining China's national security. And China is a country with rule of law. And the judicial authorities are handling the case according to law. And their lawful rights, including those in litigation rights, are preserved. So that's, you know, the position when it comes to those two Canadian citizens. Can we see the evidence of those charges? I think that we have to make sure that those issues, when it comes to the national security, we will deal with them you know, in accordance with law and according to the relevant articles of our criminal procedure law. For those uh, trials, when it comes involve the national security, it will not be open to the public. So it's the same case here in Canada. According to your relevant law, the judge can decide, the judge can decide whether the court is open because of the issue involving the national security. Well, uh, uh, okay, I hear what you're saying, but the difficulty is that most Canadians believe there is a connection between the arrest of the two Michaels and the uh, Madame Meng situation. They are troubled by the fact that Canadian diplomats are not permitted into the courtroom to see the justice system at work in China. Most Canadians are deeply concerned about the fact uh, that there is a 99% conviction rate in the courts and they wonder whether or not the two Michaels are getting a fair trial. Can you understand and appreciate why Canadians might not have that much faith in the system by which these two men are being tried right now? Because certain media people here, they tend to hype up the so-called issues of this, you know, in China and they're trying to smear China as a country that is not uh, in uh, line with laws, but rather I just uh, tell you that China is a country with rule of law and uh, we handle all those kind of things according to law and their rights are guaranteed, including those litigation rights and uh, that's for certain. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I appreciate that we have very different systems of government and different societies, China and Canada. But are you telling us here tonight that China has the same respect for the rule of law that Western democracies do? Certainly, we have different systems, political and the social systems. Even when it comes to laws, we have some different practices. But I think when it comes to the respect for law, you know, China is a country with the rule of law, and we certainly are doing that accordingly. So we ask the other side to respect our judicial sovereignty and our rule of law. Is there anything short of releasing Madame Meng that Canada could do right now, short of releasing Madame Meng, that would get China to release the two Michaels? I think that I have made the position very clear that those 
to Canadian citizens had been detained and uh, prosecuted, prosecuted uh, for the suspected crime undermining China's national security. And the case will be tried in accordance with law in China. And uh, we should wait for the, those procedures to be unfolded. So even if Canada somehow managed to get Madame Meng released and extricated from her legal situation with the United States, the trial of the two Michaels and the verdict, which has not been rendered yet, that would still go forward. As I mentioned earlier, for freeing Madame Meng back into China certainly will help create favorable conditions for the bilateral relationship. But I also emphasized that the cases of those two Canadian citizens, they are separate, you know, and they are totally different in nature from that of Madame Meng. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you raised the issue of the Uyghurs earlier, and uh, I said we would come back to it because I know you have views on this that you want to put on the record. Uh, here are some other views about what's going on over there. And, um, well, I'll just put this on the record. This month, an independent legal report. This is research from dozens of experts in human rights, eyewitness testimony, leaked Chinese government communications, satellite imagery, found the following. And we're going to put this on the record now. It found that there is a vast network of hundreds of internment camps in Xinjiang containing more than a million Uyghur detainees. Some are said to be subjected to consistent and brutal torture methods or sexual abuse. They have found evidence of forced labor factories. They have found evidence of mass forced sterilization of women, including forced abortions and IUD placements. They have found evidence of the building of orphanages to separate Uyghur children from their parents and raise them as Han Chinese, the demolition of 16,000 mosques. And the report's conclusion is that China has violated every single act prohibited by the United Nations Genocide Convention, which China has ratified, and that China bears direct state responsibility for committing genocide against the Uyghurs. That's not me talking. That's not the government of Canada talking. That is an independent legal investigation. What is your response to that? For those so-called experts, they haven't listened to the data and the information provided by the Chinese government are very authentic information. And the fact is that, as I mentioned, in Xinjiang, there's no forced labor, no concentration camps, and they are actually in nature. They are schools which had been set up in Xinjiang to cut off the source of terrorism because between 1990 and 2016, thousands of terrorist attacks happened in Xinjiang which caused heavy casualty. And I think the people here in Canada, because you are also victims of terrorism and you can understand the suffering of the people. So that's why we copied some exercises from the outside, like France, the de-radicalization centers. And also that's uh, in line with the international documents like the UN global strategy in fighting terrorism, in fighting terrorism. So we have those schools in place to make sure that the people there who had been influenced by the radical ideas, they can learn some laws and regulations and uh, they can master some uh, written language and the spoken language of the standard Chinese language. And also they can master some labor skills. So after their graduation, they all found jobs and that's very good and for them to make sure that they can back in the society. And also there was no forced sterilization at all, because in our laws, all the rights relating to women are guaranteed and preserved. For some very small number of uh, women, uh, they claim that they had gone through this process in the BBC, but actually the facts turned out to suggest that her argument was just lies, because back in 2013, this particular lady called Zuma she asked for herself to sign a form and ask the doctor to perform the relevant operation. So there's nothing like she was forced to undertake this kind of procedure. All right, and if this is the case. There was certain people had been used by the anti-Western, anti-China forces in Western countries. Just like success in the United States, the former chief of staff 
to the Secretary of State Colin Powell. He suggests that the U.S. purpose was to destabilize Xinjiang. Well, if this is in fact the case, and if China is so confident of its position and the facts as they have introduced them, why not have international observers in to confirm what you're saying and put the whole thing to rest? Xinjiang is a place wide open to the outside. In 2019, more than 200 million visits have been made to Xinjiang you know, for those tourists, not only within China, but a lot of them coming from abroad. And also, uh, since 2018, more than 1,200 people, they include diplomats, journalists, and the religious people uh, coming from more than 100 countries. They visited Xinjiang and saw with their own eyes the Xinjiang region in prosperity and stability. And what they saw, they uh, argued, were totally different from that of Western countries. And also, more than 20 countries in the Arab states, plus the Arab League, they went to Xinjiang last October. And those envoys also saw by themselves the true situation on the ground. And we do welcome the UN Human Rights High Commissioner to visit Xinjiang. And we hope the visit will be conducive to the deepening of mutual understanding, rather instead of, as some have claimed, to use it as an investigation, so, 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 suggesting China is guilty in the first place, even before the visit is conducted. Well, speaking of the United Nations, let's quote now from Bob Ray, who is Canada's ambassador to the United Nations, who had this to say about the subject that we're discussing right now. I'm going to ask our director to roll the clip of Mr. Ray from the United Nations, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. In the case of Canada, both the representative of Syria and uh, the representative of China commented on this. They said, well, look, you, you, you have significant problems with indigenous people in Canada. There have been great injusti injustices towards indigenous people. Therefore, you have no right to, to, to talk about Xinjiang or Tibet or Hong Kong. And I respectfully disagree. My own prime minister, speaking from the dais up there, was very, very clear when he said Canada cannot claim that our, our past has been, a his, has been one of no injustice towards indigenous people. In fact, quite the opposite. He accepted responsibility. We've established commissions of accountability. We've established commissions of truth and reconciliation. Where are the commissions of truth and reconciliation in China? Ambassador, could you answer his question? Because we don't need any commission like this. As I mentioned, in Xinjiang, people enjoy prosperity and stability. The average life expectancy increased from 30 years to 72 years in six decades. And the GDP increased more than 200 times in Xinjiang. But look at your human rights record. Not only those uh, First Nation people who still lack safe drinking water in many places, and all those kind of uh, systematic racial discrimination across Canada, and uh, more recently, the hate crime against uh, the Asian people so you really do look, do need to reflect on your problems. So whether this video clip or the one you showed earlier, when you show some uh, senior people in Xinjiang, there is no evidence at all suggesting that Xinjiang has this kind of human rights abuses. But rather, it's those imposed on China by some certain anti-China forces, politicians, and the media. So we do urge you to drop this kind of uh, ideological bias and now to use this as a, a means to disrupt, disrupt China's development because it will not work and it will lead to nowhere. I hear what you're saying, but I think Ambassador's, Ambassador Ray's point is that we acknowledge our failings, we call commissions of inquiry into our failings, uh, we have robust debates about our failings, and we try to do better. Uh, he's not seeing that from China. Would you acknowledge that? Because we don't have those kind of human rights problems. Not at all. What we are doing is to make sure that people are living better lives. That's the most important thing, because we are still a developing country. And for us, there's a long way to go to make sure that we will catch up in the process of modernization. But certainly, 
our purpose, you know, the party's mission is to make sure that people will be living better lives. And uh, that's good. And uh, we welcome those constructive ideas when it comes to the human rights dialogue based on mutual respect. But we certainly firmly oppose those kind of smears based on prejudice and bias. It won't work in the 21st century because the days are long gone that China could be uh, dictate, dictated by those foreign forces who did not like China's system. But for us, we respect your system and uh, we just request, ask your side to respect our system and our development path because that's the choice by the history and by the people of China. Ambassador Tsong, we are grateful for your time and we thank you for coming on to TVO tonight to take our questions. Thank you for having me today. Xian Xian. Thank you. China's perspective on relations with Canada is one thing. Canada's view, of course, is quite something else. With us now for that, let's welcome, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Paul Evans, professor in the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of British Columbia and author of Engaging China. And Joanna Chu, who covers Canada-China relations for the Toronto Star and is the author of the forthcoming book, China Unbound. And let's also welcome in the east end of the provincial capital, David Mulroney, who was Canada's ambassador to China from 2009 through 2012. Uh, grateful to have all you three with us tonight here on TVO. I thought maybe we'd just start by getting your initial reactions to the interview that uh, we just did with the Chinese ambassador. Professor Evans, you want to start us off? What stood out for you in particular? Well, the uh, ambassador's comments indicated how uh, difficult and fraught the Canada-China relationship is at this point. It's in part because of vastly different uh, understandings uh, in our publics about the other. Uh, this is not just a, a moment of a, of a diplomatic storm, but beneath it are changing public attitudes uh, and a changing global situation that is going to, going to make working with China, living with China, much more complicated for Canada and other countries and for the Chinese in dealing with us. Hmm. Joanna Chu, what stood out for you? Good work trying to get some straight answers from the ambassador, by the way. Um, I emphasize because I worked in China and Beijing and I tried to go to foreign ministry briefings to try to ask foreign officials of China questions and often I got the same kind of run around anytime anything was sensitive. Um, so just, I could have fact checked every statement basically, but just two, I think um, the ambassador said that there's no link between the two Michaels cases and Meng, uh, where in fact, um, Previous officials said publicly, and also Trudeau said um, that Chinese officials made it very clear that there was a link between the two cases and that China wants the two uh, Hmong released in exchange for the two Michael's freedom. Mm -hmm. And and secondly, um, <laughs> the fact that uh, the ambassador said there is rule of law in China. Um, in fact, Xi Jinping said several years ago that the party is above the courts in China and that judges, lawyers must be loyal um, to the party. So. Yeah, his own president uh, contradicted the ambassador there. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows that. So why would the ambassador try to say different? It's interesting because I think um, actually he spoke with my newspaper and his tone was a bit more defensive and um, abrasive. And to you, he was quite polite and, you know, tried to just spin everything in the way that he wanted positively. So, so perhaps China does feel like there is rising negative public sentiment against Beijing and might want to do some uh, PR works um, to repair some of this reputation, but they're not willing to actually speak honestly about what's happening. Hmm. Ambassador Mulroney, how about for you? Well, I think numbers you quoted at the beginning of your conversation with the ambassador, the plummeting uh, Canadian numbers vis-a-vis -vis respect for China, admiration, friendship, uh, put him into a defensive crouch, and I've seen uh, Chinese diplomats uh, do this before. They, you, they get a little bit robotic in their repeti repetition of things that not only do we know are not true, but they know are not true. But I'm going to disagree with Paul. I, I don't think this is because both countries are unable to understand each other. I think what's happened in Canada is an unprecedented degree of focus on China, in part because of the terrible thing that 
things that are happening to Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, but also because of Xinjiang and Hong Kong and South China Sea, China's wider repression against religious minorities throughout the country. And Canadians are reacting the way a democratic and free people would react in the face of that, including in the face of significant Chinese interference in Canada itself. I know I talked to the ambassador about this, but I'd like to get your views on this as well, because uh, this goes back to the tweet from the consul general in Rio de Janeiro, who tweeted a photo of Prime Minister Trudeau and the following statement. He said, boy, your greatest achievement is to have ruined the friendly relations between China and Canada and have turned Canada into a running dog of the U.S. Spendthrift. Okay, Paul Evans, I mean, that sure, to my eyes, doesn't look like uh, an attempt to introduce peace and harmony to the Canadian-Chinese relationship, but what do you make of it? It's a nasty comment, uh, unfortunate. I don't think it's um, uh, on orders from on high. Well, at least I wouldn't expect that. This is a, um, uh, a childish, undiplomatic kind of comment that, again, just inflames, rubs Canadians the wrong way and sends out the wrong signals for how China needs to manage these issues. A real mistake. Joanna, I'm not sure I've heard maybe since the days of Chairman Mao anybody refer to a Westerner as a capitalist running dog, but here we go again. Just for those who don't know the expression, what's that supposed to mean? Yeah, I actually thought it was an English expression because living in China, I heard it so much like translated through uh, state tabloids, like hawkish ones, like Global Times. Basically, uh, running dog, literally, it means a dog that runs for scraps. And it's used in China as a pejorative meaning that, uh, like if someone's a lackey or flattering or kind of like uh, slavish to someone more powerful. So in this case, he's calling Trudeau a running dog for, for Biden and the U.S. Hmm. administration, basically. Um, but just to get more context on this, um, you know, a tweet like this, um, it seems kind of really out there and it should be unusual. But in recent years, we've seen a lot of statements like this from uh, Chinese diplomatic officials, including ambassadors, call generals. Uh, for example, in Denmark, the ambassador threatened like the tiny island of Faroe. Um, threatening in really harsh words to withdraw a trade deal if Denmark doesn't use Huawei as its internet um, client for for some um, for some business mm -hmm. with Huawei. So it's part of a, a trend that people have called wolf warrior diplomacy in China, where maybe from uh, two decades or a decade ago, uh, Chinese diplomats were a lot more like the diplomats around the world that are trying to um, improve relationships um, and to put China's best face forward. Um, but in recent years, it seems that any time uh, Chinese diplomats, some of them see any sort of offense or slight, they tend to return it like 10 times more harshly, more aggressively. Well, let me pick um, up on that with Paul Evans, because, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I mean, I may be out of date on this, but I always recall that Canada and China had the basis of a decent relationship, in part because the current prime minister's father was one of the first Western leaders to recognize the People's Republic more than 50 years ago, and, you know, Dr. Norman Bethune and all of that. What has happened to that relationship, Professor Evans? Uh uh, Steve, I think that the events of the last two years have put us into a, a whole new chapter in the relationship. And respect, trust, have really been tested and found wanting in this new period. So that the Norman Bethunes, uh, the legacy of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the legacy of, of 40 years uh, of engagement, uh, we've, now, we've now entered a new chapter. This is not just a diplomatic storm, but it really is a question about whether we're, we're in a new season, uh, that we're in a winter in a relationship that, that could get colder. Uh, but that is, uh, we're not, even with the release of the two Michaels and the Madame Mung, we're not going to be able to go back to the kind of expectations we had for the relationship uh, even, even two years ago. Let me get David Mulroney to pick up on that, and we should just explain we're having some technical issues with um, Ambassador Mulroney's feed, and so we're only going to get him on the telephone as opposed to seeing his sunny presence on our program. Mm -hmm. But... Um, David, what responsibility do you think Justin Trudeau bears for the state of the relationship today? Well, I think he, he bears um, a significant amount. And it's in part because I think we've had to, as Canadians, fit through his personal uh, re-education on China. And I know he has repudiated that unfortunate statement he made before he became prime minister 
that China, he admired China's basic dictatorship, that China was the, the country he most, he most admired. And it's been a long time um, really shedding that. When he went to China to try to um, negotiate a free, trade or a free trade agreement with China, he came thinking that he could persuade the Chinese to accept his progressive uh, agenda. That more than even his earlier statement convinced me that he was completely unrealistic about the country he was up against. So now, after you know, incident after incident, and after the particular uh, trauma and the, the terrible things that are happening uh, to our two citizens, Michael Kovrig and Michael Stavor, I think he's closer to an understanding. But I would also add, and, and just from my own background, his two appointments, um, his two ambassadorial appointments, have reflected that naivete to a certain extent. Because in both John McCallum and in Dominic Barton, he's promoted promoters who really, I think, shared or share his own sense of optimism vis-a-vis -vis what's possible, vis-a-vis -vis comprehensive engagement. Uh, all right, let me pick up on that. Um, Dominic Barton is the guy right now, Joanna. Uh, how's he doing? Well, he was in Canada when the two Michaels were in trial, so people did ask questions about why he was in Canada. And he said, or, you know, officials said it was to try to forge a new uh, China policy, but Canada has actually been promising since the Michael's arrest that they would relook their China policy, which since uh, Pierre Trudeau's time has really emphasized engagement, but it mean it kind of came at expense of speaking up about human rights in some cases. Um, Trudeau's father, he actually wrote a book uh, about his travels in China during the time of the uh, Great Famine, and he didn't talk about the famine. So I think that legacy is kind of mixed and kind of controversial, Trudeau's father, whether he kind of paved a way for Canada to be unprepared for these really difficult human rights and diplomatic issues. And I should also note that the two Michaels aren't the only first Canadian political prisoners who appear to be political prisoners. Uh, Hussein Salil, he's a Canadian citizen. He's a uh, Uyghur Canadian, um, and he was actually kind of kidnapped in Uzbekistan. He didn't dare to go to Xinjiang because he, he was outspoken about what was happening uh, with Uyghurs back then being persecuted. But uh, China was able to get Uzbekistan to extradite him to, to China, and he's been in jail since, and he's had no access to Canadian consulate um, support, uh, no lawyer. His family doesn't know what crime he's been accused of, and there's several other cases, mostly Canadians of Asian descent. So unfortunately, I think racism might play a role um, where when it's like two white men, um, it's become like, oh, they're really Canadian. and. This is unacceptable, but uh, we've actually had Canadians kind of taken hostage and um, political prisoners in China for a while. And we have heard that racism angle. About. Yeah, we have heard that racism angle be, uh, been raised over the last couple of weeks in increasingly loud voices. Paul Evans, I wanted to get you back in here though to get your view on the the suggestion that maybe Dominic Barton was too naive a guy for the job at this particular time in the Canadian-Chinese relationship. What say you? Well, I don't think that understanding our um, our politicians is naive is, is, is the right starting point of the analysis. Um, I think that uh, the Trudeau government um, in, and its ambassadors have been thrown into, uh, this is a new moment in China's relations with the world. It is a more combative and difficult one, made more complicated by the geopolitical confrontation with, with the United States. Uh, and that the China we're, we're dealing with now, Xi Jinping's China, and as, uh, is more repressive, more assertive, more pushy in international affairs. And uh, any Canadian prime minister, whether it was Stephen Harper uh, or uh, even a future conservative prime minister, uh, is going to have to deal with China as it is. It's not a matter of naivety about engagement working. It did work in many kinds of ways. It's about what engagement will look like now that the circumstances are much more difficult. What can we do with China other than slide into a full Cold War confrontation? We'll follow up, follow up on that, if you would, Professor <clears throat> Evans. How do both of our countries, uh, which are neck deep in this intractable situation right now, how do we get out of it? 
Well, the, and the, 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 the immediate irritant, the three M's, Madam Mung and the two Michaels, uh, I think is inextricable. Th those are inextricably linked, huh, whatever um, the, the views of the, um, uh, of the ambassador expressed earlier today. How do we move forward? We move forward in a way where we identify those areas where we mush, must push back against China, uh, individually as a country, but also collectively with others. But that we also have a large zone of cooperation where China, with China, which is necessary and possible. For example, in trade, strangely, our trade with China last year, in the midst of all of these problems, increased by 8%. But I think the third and the most important part is that we have to find ways to continue deep and extensive dialogue with China on areas where we don't see eye to eye, but where we do see there may be common ground. And I think that's the way, strangely enough, where we can open up the Xinjiang issue in a constructive way going forward, where at the moment it's a, uh, it's a nightmare of tit for tat retaliations. Let me pick up with David Mulroney on that. We know that in the headlines, there is a great deal of saber rattling right now. Do you suspect, Ambassador Mulroney, based on your own experience, having been in China in the last decade, that there are, I don't know, are there back channel things going on right now we might not know about that suggest that this thing can get out of the muck? I'm not optimistic about that. I think what's happening in China is unprecedented. And, and let me just add, uh, to, again, sorry to disagree with Paul, uh, the Prime Minister has had since 2015 to understand uh, Xi Jinping. So I think it's more than fair to hold him accountable for not understanding him. And let's, he appointed someone in Dominic Barton who said that he was a great fan. Um, he, he said he had drunk the Kool-Aid on Xi Jinping's Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, his learning curve is, is stretching out pretty long, too. But as to back channels, I think China now is hunkered down because they have there's a crisis with Canada, but there's a crisis with the United States, which is far more serious for them, with Australia, with India, with the U.K., with Europe. They haven't had this many uh, crises to deal with, all of them of their own making, all of them due to Xi Jinping's overreach. And we're seeing them respond in two ways. One is the kind of robotic a response that we, you heard from the, the ambassador to Canada, which is uh, the more traditional response. But we're also hearing increasingly um, irresponsible tweets from people like younger diplomats, like the consul general from Rio, which insulted uh, the prime minister directly and also invoked language from the Cultural Revolution. We've had, you know, the, the Chinese embassy in Washington talked about uh, Uyghur women as, um, you know, breeding machines, uh, they, another diplomat uh, spread theories that the uh, start of the pandemic was due to a U.S. military labs experimentation. There seems to be a lack of control of Chinese diplomacy, which is worrying, precisely because it makes you wonder, what else isn't under control? Are Chinese fighter pilots inclined to engage in some uh, you know, dramatics? Are, China, are PLA Navy commanders uh, all under control? The, the, the tone and the nature of the rhetoric is worrying and suggests how ill-prepared China is to handle a crisis of their own making. Paul Evans, you want to come back on that? Well, I think that um, framing uh, Chinese actions uh, as all assertive, all aggressive, all, uh, is, is, is to misunderstand the complex Tit for tat action reaction system that uh, has unfortunately emerged uh, as the US and China have plunged into uh, a competitive, strategic competitive relationship. Uh, many things that Xi Jinping's government are unfortunate and I think are going to be seen as counterproductive. But to simply put the spotlight on Chinese atrocities, Chinese problems, Chinese weaknesses is, uh, uh, is unfortunate. Uh, but more importantly, it doesn't catch the global picture. China is not losing in the world of, of global diplomacy. It's certainly losing in the context of the Western liberal democracies. But China's influence in its neighborhood and in the world more broadly is not being opposed. Uh, it is being, um, uh, I would say, skeptical and cautiously adopted 
by much of the world. The balance of forces are shifting. And if it's us versus them, uh, there's no clear outcome, no clear decision on which is going to triumph. Let's hope we can find a third path. Joanna, as I get you back in here, I want to point out that you've got a book coming out about these issues in the fall. It's called China Unbound. And I want to pluck a little excerpt from it to read to you and our listeners and viewers right now and then ask you a question coming out the other side. For too long, you write, Western societies have mishandled or simply ignored Beijing's actions out of narrow self-interest. Decades of willful misinterpretation have over time become complicity in the toxic diplomacy, human rights abuses, and foreign interference seen from China. Let's pick that apart a bit. What are we misinterpreting? So actually, uh, experts and people of Chinese descent living in Canada, for example, have been warning for years that China has been gearing up to be more aggressive and that they have been working in subtle ways to try to gain influence, foreign influence in Canada such as resorting to trying to control the Chinese language media here for intimidation, coercion. Um, Chinese officials have, I found out in my reporting, have visited the homes of Canadians trying to get them to stop talking about things like the Hong Kong pro-democracy protests. And I, I just argue in my book that this information has been out for decades. I've seen testimonies to Parliament back in 2006 by Canadians trying to warn Canada, like, it can't just be about economic and trade with China all the time. They need to be aware that there's other aspects of the relationship happening that they can't ignore because at some point it's going to just blow up. And, and we've seen this get to a point where it's very difficult to, to get back to a place where you can have constructive conversations because I think uh, a lot of countries in the West have hoped that by engaging with China and focusing on economic trade and, uh, and, and being fine with China becoming a huge economic power because it would benefit them as well, uh, has gotten to a point where now we're having conversations about what to do with hostage-taking diplomacy, what to do with what's happening in Xinjiang. And these are huge problems that um, we could have had 10 years or more to, to think about and evaluate rather than just kind of scrambling now. So I feel a lot of nations are playing catch up because they had been trying to be willfully ignoring some of these really messy aspects of authoritarian China. Um, and I do talk in my book and I do uh, agree with Paul about how we have to look domestically as well, especially the U.S. trying to be a leader. Now they're trying to um, form more alliances uh, with Canada, with the EU, Australia to um, place these sanctions, uh, for example, uh, on China. Um, it's not very convincing. Like the Trump administration alone has given China so much propaganda material to call the West a hypocrite uh, when you have rioters trying to disrupt and dismantle uh, results of a democratic election. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, forgive me, uh, also, Joanna, yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump in for a second because, uh, Paul Evans, I'm keeping an eye on the clock for you. I know we lose you in about two minutes because you've, like, like many people nowadays, we've got Zoom feeds uh, back to back to back. So maybe just give us a final comment, if you would, on the work that the Institute at your university is doing on the issue of the Uyghurs <clears throat> and how at face value, we ought to take the comments that the ambassador made in our interview about them living happy, healthy lives in China. Well, I think one of the important issues going forward is what we're going to do in our universities uh, in maintaining contact with China, but also looking at it through a, a realistic and critical eye. The Xinjiang Documentation Center at UBC brings together materials from many different perspectives. Uh, and uh, it uh, uh, paints a picture uh, in Xinjiang that is, is more complicated than what the ambassador had to say, but also rather different than what is coming out uh, from uh, some of the reports that have been quoted by our parliamentarians and others. The situation on the ground is complicated. And I think most importantly, Steve, is our universities have a role in trying to understand and explain why China is doing what it is doing in certain circumstances. Preventive terrorism of the kind they're trying in Xinjiang is uh, disproportionate, probably counterproductive, but it does have a, uh, we've got to get it, why that terrorism threat is there. Is there anything we can do collectively around these things that in the longer term will actually improve the situation in Xinjiang rather than just taking a critical and sanctions perspective? Paul Evans from the University of British Columbia, we're grateful that you could spare as much time as you did for us, and now we release you to take your other Zoom call. So thanks for joining us. 
Thank you very much. Wonderful to be with you. Not at all. Uh, David Mulroney, I'm going to rely on you now to pick up from where Paul Evans left off. He said that the situation with the Uyghurs in China is a lot more complex than either the human rights groups or the government of China is letting on. What's your view on it? Well, I, my jaw dropped when he talked about preventive terrorism. And this worries me deeply. This isn't preventive terrorism. Xinjiang is uh, an area of Western China that's as large as the Southwest of the United States. It has just a few, it's just a little bit smaller in population than Ontario. And as you said at the outset, China is engaged in a massive operation to essentially remove the Uyghur people, to erase a culture with more than a million incarcerated, with the kind of forced sterilization and forced abortion, where despite what the ambassador said, in recent terms, population rates in major Uyghur centers uh, like Kashgar are plummeting where Uyghurs are being used for forced labor, not just in, in Xinjiang, but across China. And this is unprecedented. But it's not just uh, what's happening at present. It's because China in Xinjiang is experimenting with the 21st century surveillance state. They're now looking at technology in China that measures in classrooms the emotional engagement of the student. So students are now deeply stressed that they're not looking concerned enough at the camera as they speak. What's happening it should, should worry us. It's not tit for tat. It's a principled response to the single greatest humanitarian outrage uh, in, in recent time. And the, the, trying to explain it uh, really only um, un undermines our opportunity to understand what's happening and plays into a tendency to avoid what is unpleasant and seems very difficult to deal with. And uh, at a time when we should be ramping up our sanctions and thinking more about what we can do to make this, uh, to, to make clear that we understand what's happening and there will be consequences, that kind of uh, argumentation is, uh, I think, inaccurate and unhelpful. Well, Joanna, we've got Ambassador Mulroney's view. We've got Professor Evans' view. They're both very different views. Where do you come at this? Um, from I, I share uh, Ambassador Mulroney's kind of um, disapproval of some of <laughs> Mr. Evans' language, even though I feel bad because he's not here right now to defend his language. He may have misspoken. Um, so, But I do think that it's helpful to have the context of what led to the Chinese government resorting to internment camps of a million Uyghurs, because that is very extreme. Um, uh, in 2009, there, there was a deadly riot in Yurumchi in, in Xinjiang, where actually Han Chinese, so people who look like me, uh, ethnic majority in China, who had been encouraged to migrate to the Xinjiang area in a uh, government kind of campaign to try to they say it's to like improve the economy there, but a lot of Uyghurs who have lived there for centuries, for millennia, say that it was a way to dilute them, to forcibly assimilate them. And these tensions um, led to fatal clashes on the streets between Han Chinese and Uyghur people. And it's unclear how many died, but it's clear that people on both sides, both ethnic groups, suffered and were the perpetrators. But what the Chinese state did was that they completely blamed the Uyghurs. They blamed Uyghur extremism and terrorism for this violence. And since then, they've stepped up incrementally. Uh, the security presence in Xinjiang, the monitoring, the high-tech surveillance that uh, Mr. Moroni talked about. And I actually spoke with people who survived uh, months in these internment camps, and they tell me they were taken for things like just being on a business trip. I spoke with a Kazakh woman in my book who, who was just there in Xinjiang buying some textiles for her shop in Kazakhstan, and for some reason she was suspected of, of some crime and taken to this camp for 15 months, uh, and she was given like a Chinese name, a code, and she had no access to her family back home. And another man, um, he was... He was uh, persecuted for having a CD in his home that had uh, costumes of Turkic nature because China sees uh, the Uyghur people's identification with their Turkic type of ethnic groups as also somehow criminal. Um, so these things, it's I think it's dangerous to brand it as 
anywhere close to terrorism because um, what the Chinese state is doing is that it's taking all of these people and they don't know you could do anything and it could be seen as you might be become a terrorist it's kind of like a potential like um you're interested in a turkic uh costume maybe you want xinjiang to be separate and you're a terrorist so i think it's important for us not to adopt the language of china that legitimizes their in intense paranoia of uh, so many people becoming terrorists when there has been isolated violence but um you know, years ago, and there's no evidence that there's a widespread terrorism movement right now in Xinjiang. I want to thank both of you for joining us on TVO tonight. We thank Paul Evans from UBC earlier, Joanna Chu, who uh, reports for the Toronto Star on Canada Chinese issues. Look for her book this fall, China Unbound. And David Mulroney, we didn't get the pleasure of seeing your face this time, but we certainly heard your wisdom. Uh, our former ambassador to China from 2009 to 2012, we're grateful you could spare some time for us tonight here on TVO as well. Many thanks, you too. That is the agenda for Tuesday, March the 30th, 2021. With vaccines rolling out faster and to a wider swath of people, is it time to talk about vaccine passports? Well, we will tomorrow. Also, author Alison Gopnik will be here with us to explain why a child's consciousness can rightly be described as filled with wonder, quite unlike what's usually available to adult consciousness. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Looking for more of TVO's in-depth current affairs and documentaries? Visit tvo.org slash daily and sign up for our daily newsletter with links to agenda interviews, Steve Pakin's blogs, and preview our upcoming documentaries. That's all at tvo.org slash daily.